Hello, everyone. We are live. I am, of course, a slightly fashionably late to my own, uh, I don't know what the word is. Wow, brain, work. But we are uh, currently in the second session for today, and that is for the AuthorTube virtual retreats. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you've already tuned in um, for the first session, let me know. There's a lot going on today. So First things first, uh, check the description below and there will be all the links to all the sessions, um, all the info, there's giveaways going on today, there is um, writing sprints going on today, and of course all of this that you are watching here will um, be available for replay. So if you miss anything, no worries, but being here live is the best thing that you can do. So. Let me just finish setting up some stuff. Um, let me know how you guys are doing today. It's awfully hot over where I am. And let's see. I'm going to go ahead and try this. And I'm just going to double check that you guys are seeing everything correctly. Do, do, do. All right. I'm just going to make sure... I'm going to refresh my page over here to make sure that things are looking correct. I think they should be, but I always get nervous. Let's see. Hold on. Okay, it is, well, it's kind of working. That's not exactly the way I wanted it to go. Let's try this. There we go. Okay. That's better. <laughs> All right. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Today we're talking about book marketing which is just, there's so much to talk about. Um, that's not what I wanted to do. I'm sorry, guys. All right, there we go. Um, so today, these are the things we're going to be talking about. We're talking mostly about like very large, like big picture stuff. Um, I'm going to keep, I'm going to try my best to keep my eye on the comments. Um, but I already know I missed a lot of them. So I hope you guys didn't ask any questions. Um, <clears throat> So today we'll be discussing what it means to market your book and kind of the mindset you have to develop, uh, treating your book as a business, uh, determining ROI, which is return on investment, and then finding marketing methods that work for you. So like I said, this is all very big picture stuff. Um, so if you have any questions, let me know and I will be happy to stop and answer them. And, but also know we'll have a Q&A at the end. But I'm going to try my darnest not to go over because like I said, there's a full schedule of events today. So I don't want to go off topic. So let me introduce myself in case you guys don't know who I am. My name is Mandy Lynn. I'm a YouTuber. I make videos once a week here on YouTube on writing, publishing, and book marketing. I'm also a book cover designer. I do custom book covers as well as formatting. I'm over on Patreon with more videos, podcasts, and AuthorTube Academy lessons. And I'm also the creator of the Book Launch Planner, which is a planner designed for authors by authors to help you plan your book launch without the stress. So. Without further ado, just to give you a little background on myself and my books, these are my fiction books. I obviously can't decide what genre I like, so I write in all of them. And then these are my nonfiction books. So these are um, all about marketing. So a lot of today, uh, I didn't want to go into detail about stuff like the this. what you see in these books are really the nitty gritty stuff, where today is the more broad because I feel like a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is sometimes overlooked by authors, um, especially the ROI thing. That's something I especially am learning a ton of today. So if you're ever like, hey, I want to learn more about my author platform or about ads or um, how to set up my books for success, these books are the place to go. But let's just jump right into it. So what does it mean to market your book? So first and foremost, you have to tell everyone about your book. And I included dentists, friends, and family. And I included my dentist because my dentist is usually the last person I feel like telling. So um, I, I think it's super, super important to be absolutely proud of your book and to tell everyone about it because I've seen a lot of authors complain about not having book sales. And odds are they're not having book sales 
because they don't tell anyone their book exists. They expect that they will publish it and it'll just kind of sell itself. Um, and obviously that's not true. And some people have the issue of they don't want to talk about their book and their author life to their friends and family because they aren't supportive. So to that, I say, prove them wrong. Um, so I, I will admit I've never had an issue with friends and family not being supportive. My friends and family have always been the most supportive. I've maybe been embarrassed a little bit and not wanted to talk about it but you if you want to treat your books in your author platform and your business as a whole as a success you have to act like it's a it's a success before it is so that's kind of what I'm talking about so if people ask what you do um, maybe you'll tell people you have a full-time job but you could also be like oh and I also write books on the side and Maybe I'm hoping to make that my full-time gig someday. So that's what I mean. Just be proud of what you produce. Uh, so to get business results, you need to treat yourself like a business. Respect yourself and your book as if it were your full-time job. Um, and that's kind of, I think that's the major 20, turning point for me. So for those of you who don't know, um, in March, I got laid off from my job. Unrelated to today's uh current events, I was just laid off due to budget cuts. And I think I was able to somewhat seamlessly or as seamlessly as possible make the move from working full time to working on my books and my business full time. Because even when I had a full time job, I treated my business as my full time job. So it was basically like I was working two full time jobs. And yes, that's incredibly stressful. But it's something that's so, so important because if I didn't do all that prep work, I would probably be out searching for other jobs right now. And lastly, find pride in your work because if you aren't proud of your books, you aren't going to want to talk about them. And I've had this struggle where I think every author goes through this where you're going to be self-conscious of something, especially once reviews start coming in, because odds are someone's going to write a bad review of your book and it's going to mention exactly what you feared most. So then you're sitting there like, oh my God, my fears have been con confirmed. I am an awful writer. I, sh I am not meant for this. But basically, I'm telling you that you kind of need to tell that voice in the back of your head to shove it and be proud of your book otherwise because um, I've had a lot of issues with my books in the past where there's stuff that I'm like I should go back and correct it and because of that I'm like I don't want to promote it and then all that I'm doing is losing sales because I'm not proud of my books so I you know need to get over that or go ahead and fix whatever I'm self-conscious about and then move forward because that's the beauty especially um, if you're self-published, you can always go back and fix stuff. There's no one stopping you from that. So if you get a review that's like, this scene is unrealistic, you can be like, well, I'm just going to edit that a bit. Now, you don't have to do that, but I'm just saying it's an option in that you can take advantage of. So treat yourself as a business. So what does it mean to treat your books as a business? So give yourself deadlines. And I know you're the only one enforcing them, but pretend that you have a publisher that's looming over your head, and if you don't meet the deadlines, you're going to lose your publishing contract. Um, ask yourself, how will this result in book sales? I cannot tell you. Um, the biggest thing that's allowed me to actually make an income today is that now I ask myself this question, because I was always guilty of... Um, I guess shiny object syndrome in terms of new marketing methods that I could try. And some marketing methods may work for some people and some may not. And I was the type of person who liked to try everything. So now I ask myself, how will this result in book sales? And if it does not, if it does not compute and translate to book sales, I tell myself, I can't do that. Um, or if you're just, I, I'm the type of person who also likes to um, buy new equipment, like uh, upgrade cameras and, and software and all that. And now I ask myself, is this going to be 
Like, is this lucrative? Is this smart? And if it's not, I have to say, okay, maybe another time. Um, so yeah, that's basically the gist of that. Ask yourself, how will it result in making more money long term? And if it doesn't, say no. So next up, we're going to be talking about determining ROI, which is return on investment. This is something that, again, this is probably the biggest lesson I've learned. And I think Amanda said, <laughs> Amanda's saying it best. You tried it also. We wouldn't have to. Isn't that the truth? I try out a lot of stuff. And that's also because before I had the cushion of working full time and, you know, having my business doing well enough that I could try new stuff. But now since I don't work full time and don't have a steady paycheck, I now determine on my, you know, business's income to actually make me money. So I can't play around as much as I used to. Um, so determining ROI is just figuring out if what you spend is worth what you make, to put it simply. So if you spend $50 on an ad, how much money will you make in the sales? Or um, ROI isn't always money, though that's usually how most businesses view it. But I think especially as an entrepreneur, you have to keep your time in consideration as well. So if you spend one week putting together a marketing plan, will the results be worth your time? Now, usually the best thing um, that entrepreneurs like to do is they're like, I would rather invest my time into something rather than money, which usually works out. But if you're investing a ton of time into something that ultimately isn't making you money, you will have to, you know, maybe drop that. So I'm going to go through a few examples. Um, Pre-order campaigns are something that can be relatively easy to figure out ROI on. So you ask yourself two questions. How much does it cost and how much time do you have to invest into it? So here's an example. This is probably the clearest example I could come up with. Um, and that's because, so I just had the, uh, I'm or I'm still having the um, pre-order campaign going for the book launch planner. It actually comes out this week. Uh, well, well, Tuesday technically, which is still next week, but a few days. Um, so when I made the pre-order campaign, I had to figure out how much it would cost and how much time I had to invest into it. And because I sell my planner myself, like it's not through um, KDP or anything like that, it's even easier for me to figure out all the numbers. So how much does it cost? So the things I spent money on for the pre-order campaign was um, technically, I lost money because I was giving a $5 coupon. I was giving out free paperback books, and I was also giving out free stickers. So retail, that would cost $20. So for anyone buying, that's like $20 worth of benefits. Um, but for me, it only actually cost me $6 because um, I was kind of able to ignore the coupon because it's just making me a little bit less money. Um, and then I factored in the cost it took to print the paperback and the cost it took to uh, print the stickers, which is about $6. And then lastly, how much time did I have to invest into it? So I didn't technically have to invest any time, like any extra time, I should say, because as it is, I already had to package and print everything regardless. Uh, whereas if this was a book that was sold through Kindle Direct Publishing, I wouldn't have to package the planner. So then anything else that I shipped out to people would be an extra bit of time. But because I have to ship people the planner anyways, I just include all the freebies in with the packaging. But um, so that's the cost of time and the costs of actual costs. And the results was over 100 planners were sold during the pre-order period, which is, again, something that's still going on now. Um, so another example would be Amazon ads. These are a little bit trickier, um, but when you get down to the nitty gritty and you can compare the numbers, it makes way more sense. So how much does it cost? So that's easy. Amazon ads will... Uh, you can set your bid amount. You can set what you want to cap it at. Um, if you don't know how Amazon ads work, I highly, highly recommend reading book three of the Marketing for Author series, which is book sales that multiply. Um, I kind of go into nitty gritty in terms of 
how to set it up and how to understand it and everything like that. But say you set your budget for Amazon ads for $20 and then you have to ask yourself how much time did you invest into setting it up. I usually spend about an hour setting up one ad and that's so I can do the proper research to set everything up because if you set it up incorrectly, you're wasting your time. Um, and then the results would be something like $50 in revenue, which means that you made $30 in profit. And honest to God, that's just a number I'm pulling out of the sky. So who knows? <laughs> it could be all over the place. I've had ads that have flopped. I've had ads that have done really well. It's kind of learning um, the keywords that work, the keywords that don't work. And um, if you've read book sales that multiply, you know that when you run an ad, especially an Amazon ad, you want to constantly keep an eye on it because um, sometimes things can get fluky and you'll notice like you're spending way too much bidding on a certain keyword that you're realizing doesn't work for your book. Um, so again, just make sure that you do your research before you jump into Amazon ads. <clears throat> uh, another example, and this is probably something that's a little more relatable to everyone because this is in terms of your platform, determining your ROI on your platform. So in this instance, I'm talking specifically about your newsletter and social media platform. So ask yourself first, what does it cost? Um, so if you're just talking about your newsletter and social media, odds are it's either going to cost you nothing or it's going to cost you a little bit to start it up. So if you have a newsletter, you'll also want to have a website. And obviously, um, to start a website, that's not completely free. So just keep that in mind. Um, but then you can ask yourself, how much time do you have to invest? Uh, if you want to invest one hour a day into your uh, author platform, then that can be great. Uh, and your results could be something like $50 of revenue a month. And when you take that, like your $50 a month, and you compare that to the amount of time that you've invested into it, you may sit back and be like, well, that's not worth it at all. That's just getting paid pennies if you take the amount of time versus the amount you've actually made per hour. But over time, these numbers will grow. Platforms take a long time to grow and morph into something that actually generates income. It's not going to happen overnight. And I think that's the biggest thing is that when people, um, <laughs> When they learn about marketing, especially when it comes to your platform, they think that I just have to read this book and follow every step and it's going to work perfectly and it'll go quickly. And sometimes that can happen, but most of the time you will follow every step and you will do everything you are told and it could still take a long time to work out. That doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. That just means it's going to take a little bit for things to catch on. So you kind of just have to be a stickler when it comes to these sort of things and stay determined. And after a while, um, the larger your platform gets, the more search engines will kind of work in your favor and continue to recommend your content. And the best part about having a platform is that you can also use your platform to produce revenue. Um, so for example, if you're on uh, uh, if you're on YouTube, you can get revenue off of YouTube by um, setting up a Google AdSense account and get paid for the ads that show up on your videos, which can also just make things um, more worth it, so to say. And same for Instagram, you can do like sponsored posts, although I've never done that personally, but I know other people do it. So there's just a lot of um, that can go into your platform besides just making sales off of your books. Um, someone just had a quick question. Do you have an ebook version of the book launch planner? Um, so I know people have asked this question quite a bit. Um, because the book launch planner, like it's meant to be a physical planner, I don't have any plans to make it an ebook version. Um, but I do know that the biggest hindering thing is the shipping cost. So I do hope that in the future, I'm able to adjust the shipping costs by working with like people to figure that out. Cause I know it's a thing that you can like negotiate shipping costs if you ship a lot of stuff, but I'm working on that. I'm trying. <laughs> um, so finding marketing methods that work for you. So these are kind of like the big marketing methods 
I'm sure there are other ones. There are God knows how many ways you can market your book, but these are really the big ones and the ones that are really upfront. So um, I like to say there's two different versions of having an author platform. One author, one platform is through the reader's point of view, and that would be more like you consider yourself a book blogger. You talk about books, you talk about reading, um, all that sort of thing, and you just also happen to be an author yourself. And then there's the author platform where you're more search engine oriented, where you're creating content that people are looking for. So you're not hoping to just pop up in someone's social media feed and that they'll enjoy your content, you are hoping that people on Google or on YouTube or even on Pinterest looking for something specific and they find your content that way. Um, and that is nine times out of 10 what you guys would consider an author tuber, which is people that teach um, being an author and being a writer. And um, in that same way, you also uh, connect with readers. Uh, but I will go into that a little bit more. And then there's newsletter swaps and author events and book signings. And last but not least, ads. So just to jump into everything, first and foremost, your author platform, that's from a reader's point, point of view. So if you're if from an Instagram perspective, to put it simply, you're a bookstagrammer. You are taking photos of books and you're posting them all over Instagram and you're talking about reading on Instagram. Um, and more or less, this can translate over to Facebook, Twitter, blogging, and YouTube. Uh, so you are stepping into the shoes of the reader and the way you would build your platform using this method would be depending largely upon social interaction with the community as a whole. So you're not worried too much about search engine optimization. You are relying heavily on reading about books, talking about books, and talking to other people about books. And that's how you build. So instead of um, hoping that people find you, you are constantly reaching out to the community, which can be ideally a really great way to market your book because you are essentially, the way you're marketing is you're marketing only to readers. So you're connecting only to people who read books. And ideally, the book, the books you post about on your blog or your Instagram are books that are very similar in genre to your own book. So when you go ahead and post about your book, um, all your followers are like, oh my God, I need to read it. Uh, then we have the other form of your author platform, which could be a search engine point of view. So again, this is... Um, this would be very much creating content that people are looking for. So that duck timer means that it's time for our secret word. Um, so in the description below, we have to put a pause to everything. I'm sorry. In the description below, there is a form that you can fill out. But I highly suggest that you guys wait to fill out the form until the end of the day. Uh, during each session, there's a secret word that each of us are giving out. And the more secret words you collect, the better chance you have at winning an Amazon gift card. So to my, my secret word is rambling because I feel I ramble sometimes. So go ahead and write down rambling. Uh, make a note to yourself and collect all the secret words from today and eventually fill out the form down below. Winners will be announced at the end of the month. So again, secret word is rambling. I hope you guys enjoyed the duck sound to remind you all that we had a secret word. So, uh, <laughs> and um, I guess I'll jump back into it now. <laughs> so uh, again, let me see where I was, okay. You can, you can do the type of platform where you're doing a search engine optimization sort of platform on uh, through blogging, YouTube, and Pinterest, and technically also social media platforms. But blogs, YouTube, and Pinterest rel rely heavily on search engine optimization. This means you're targeting your audience, keeping um, your SEO in mind. 
And it also, this means that in order to have this type of platform, you depend largely on having knowledge of search engine optimization because you're creating content that people are looking for. So again, you're not waiting for people to stumble upon you or you're not trying to reach out to people, which yes, you can technically still reach out to people. Um, but ultimately, if you write a blog post, you are creating it in a way that you are hoping that Google will pick up your post and make it show up in search. And there are a lot of ways to do that. My full-time job before I got laid off was part graphic design and part search engine optimization, um, where I worked on making sure that the website was showing up in search. <laughs> you guys are laughing about the duck sound. Um, so moving on to newsletter swaps. So newsletter swaps are when you work with other authors who cross promote your books. Um, so basically you'd find an author who writes in a similar genre to you and you both agree that on this day you'll promote each other's books in your newsletters. Um, that way you're both reaching a new audience and you're both getting benefits and you don't have to pay for it because you're just swapping services technically. Um, so in order to do newsletter swaps, you kind of depend largely on having a newsletter or the or the knowledge to build, build and grow your newsletter because a good, like if you want to swap with someone because they have a newsletter of 5,000 subscribers and you only have 500 subscribers, Odds are the person with 5,000 subscribers isn't going to want to swap because they feel like that's not a large, that's not a fair trade off. So you need to know first how to build your newsletter into um, something that's large, large and has a good click through rate. So other people will want to swap with you. And you can find authors to swap newsletter with um, by joining Facebook groups. And using the Story Origin app, I love the Story Origin app, and I'm hoping more and more authors are starting to use it because it's a great database and it also has a ton of other cool features. So be sure to check them out. I love. I've had a blast working with them, and they they're just always constantly making new updates to the website as well. Uh, so author signings and events. This is one of my favorite favorite ways to market. So uh, this means that you have to work with stores and conventions to schedule signings. For bookstores, you have to share the profit that you make with the store. But with conventions, you get to keep all the profit, but you do have to pay for booth space. Um, so some events can be a hit or miss. I personally have found that bookstores are more of a miss for me. They're more networking events than they are about sales because it's just really hard to get a lot of people to show up to bookstores and to make a decent amount of sales where it's actually worth your time. Uh, whereas conventions, I've had a lot more luck. I can pay um, anywhere from 100 to $300 for, a books, uh, for booth space, but then I could sell anywhere from 200 to $600 worth of books, so it tends to be a lot more of return on invention, in, return on investment in that way. Um, and ultimately, even if some events are a miss, they're a great networking opportunity to reach new readers. I've had many, many, many miss events. Uh, probably the biggest being BookCon. It's BookCon is so expensive for those of you who don't know. Um, for an indie author, it'll cost you about $2,000 to get booth space at BookCon. And it's all, it just feels impossible to break even, especially if you only have a few books that are out. Um, so in that case, that was very much a networking opportunity because that's really one of the few events where every single person that comes to that event is a reader. So um, your hope is that you can just give out a lot of business cards and maybe you'll get people buying your book on Kindle or later on on Amazon. Um, and the best part about these types of events is that 
you could literally, you could have no social media platform. You could have no website, though you should still have a website. And you can have no newsletter. And you can still see sales. You could be a brand new author who has nothing going on. And you could have a book signing. And you could sell God knows how many books. And people would never know that you have zero platform. And that's the best part of it. Because as long as you are personable and really talk to people you will make sales now the bummer part is um COVID-19 does not allow us to have these events uh and as someone who does these events once a month this is heartbreaking and I hate it with a passion I I had god knows how many events scheduled and either every single one has been canceled or rescheduled and has not even be been rescheduled yet um but hopefully starting in 2021, you guys can start doing stuff like this. I love doing events like this. Um, and if you guys, I think I have, yeah, on Patreon, I have a podcast where I go into the details of doing events, especially vendor events, because I feel like those are the most beneficial ones. Um, and I talk about stuff like sales tax and um you know the the fees and and all of that sort of stuff so if you are curious on how that works exactly just go over onto the um it would be the ask me anything podcast on patreon and i have an episode where i talk all about book signings so yeah that's there um and then last but not least we have ads so there are many places you can have ads and that includes facebook amazon bookbub and goodreads those are the big ones um but i've also done ads where like i'll find um I think it was for She's Not Here, I found a newsletter for thriller readers, and I paid to have my book She's Not Here featured in that newsletter. Uh, do, 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 do. Yes, so the editing bard says that farmer's markets have been great for me in terms of getting clients and meeting people. Yeah, I love, literally, I comic cons can be okay. Um, book fairs are okay, usually less than okay, if you ask me, because there's too many other authors, so it's hard to sell. Um, but vendor fairs, like Christmas vendor fairs and farmer's markets are literally the best events ever. My personal favorite, wine and chocolate festivals. I, I've had the best luck with sales with wine and chocolate festivals, because I have a little sign that I put out that says, wants, um want something to read with that wine or something like that. But anywho, back to ads. <laughs> so uh, ads can be great, but I will warn you, there's a big learning curve. Um, but it's also nice because it doesn't require you to have an author platform at all. As long as you have your ads set up and people click on them and hopefully your <laughs> hopefully your Amazon page is set up so when people click on the ad and they visit the actual Amazon page they're like oh my god this book is great i need to buy it right now um and that's really that's the biggest thing when it comes to ads is not the targeting um although that's a big part but i i've had the experience where i had people clicking on my ad and it was going great, but I never made the sale. And the issue there is that for whatever reason, my Amazon page where the where you actually sell the book just was not good enough to finish making that sale. So what I ended up doing was that I would go in and I would tweak the description of my book and I would highlight some reviews from Amazon reviewers and I would just do whatever I can to prove this is the book they need to buy. And sometimes you can also just have the issue where you accidentally target the wrong person. So when they like, you may set up your ad where it sounds a certain way and then when they actually click on it and see the book, they may realize, oh, the book isn't what I thought it was gonna be. So that's where the targeting, targeting comes in hand as well. So again, if you wanna learn more about that, that would be book sales that, mul <laughs> book sales that multiply. Um, so now, which marketing method is best for you? So that's really the big catch because you may learn about every single marketing method and not know what to do with yourself uh, because you can't spread yourself thin. Um, 
And this is something that you'll see a lot of people doing where at the beginning they may be like, I'm going to be on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and, and I'll have a blog. And then you'll notice over time they'll slowly start to like delete, delete, delete and focus on two or three things at most. Um, so really, if you can figure that out at the beginning, then that's great. But if you have to do it down the line, that's also good as well. So ask yourself first, what are you good at and what do you enjoy? So if you don't enjoy being on camera, don't be on YouTube. That's as simple as that. If you don't enjoy it, don't force yourself to do it just because you think it's going to be a good marketing thing. Um, and where do you want to invest your time? So if uh, Instagram, I love Instagram. But I also feel like I struggle hardcore with Instagram. Um, but that's also something I want to get better at. So even though I, I'm not in, I, I don't feel like it comes effortless to me. It's something that I want to invest my time in because I personally, on a personal level, enjoy photography. So Instagram should be my, my go-to, but it's not. Um, but I want to get better at it. So I want to invest my time into it. And lastly, what is the best way to sell your genre? Ignore the typo. I didn't see it until just now. <laughs> um, so, for example, different genres will show up in different places online. So, for the biggest example, children's books. My children's books, uh, my children's book, Mr. Moon's Big Move. Um, I am highly, highly aware that I will have a hard time selling it online. And there's a lot of reasons for that. The biggest reason is probably just because the children's book genre is so freakishly oversaturated, it will be so hard to be heard above everything else. Um, and also because my platform is, I, I don't make YouTube videos about parenting. Therefore, I do not, I, I probably have parents on social media. In fact, I'm sure a small handful of you watching, or maybe a large handful, I don't know. Um, some of you watching are parents with children who might be the perfect age for my children's book, but you are not my target, or I am not targeting you guys. You just happen to be here anyways. Um, whereas I know that when I do events again, when all of this is said and done, when I do events again, I know even if it's not an event targeted for children, I cannot tell you how many times I've been at my booth and a small child comes up to me and for whatever reason chooses to pick up She's Not Here, my one and only adult book, and says, what is this about? And for that reason, I have written a children's book mostly because I want to redirect them to something else. Be like, here, look at this. Um, but also because I've I've seen it in effect where if someone has a children's book at their booth, a child will grab their parent's hand and physically drag them to that booth. And that's all I need to make a sale. Um, whether that be the children's book or maybe I can get the parent interested in one of my other books as well. So that's just my little marketing method. And also, um, a children's book opens up a wide variety of stuff. You could do fun uh, events at uh, bookstores where you can read the book to kids and you could make a big to do out of it. You could go to schools and read the book. But again, all of that has to wait until all of this is over. Um, and then when it comes to nonfiction, um, you're the best thing for you to do in terms of showing up online is having an author platform that is search engine driven. So um, for me, as someone who has how to videos on writing, marketing and publishing, you can imagine that my marketing for author, uh, my marketing for authors books sell really well. Um, whereas my fiction, uh, that would be best sold from the reader's point of view. Now it does naturally sell anyways, because um, authors are also readers, so I sell them naturally through that. But if you are someone who only plans on ever writing fiction and you don't enjoy teaching on that level, you could do videos or not. Well, you could do videos from a reader's point of view. That's called BookTube. Um, but you could do you could focus more on the book reading content rather than the book writing content. So. 
yeah. <laughs> so that is all I had prepared, which actually wrap this up very nicely in, in terms of timing. So this is the part where I'm going to let you guys ask any questions you want. Um, I don't think I saw any question. Well, I, I saw questions, but I believe I answered them as they came in, but let me know if you have anything that you want to ask me. And let me see if I can turn off the screen. There we go. Okay. So it's question time, and I'm also going to wrap this up slightly early because I believe the editing bard is here in the comments, and he has his next um, stream that's right after this, so you guys can join that. So, um, yes, so I write really, hi, Meg. Uh, she says, I've heard that nonfiction books perform really well if they answer a question people are asking in the search bar. So, yes, absolutely. Um, oops. Um, so you can, that's actually like, that's also kind of how I create my YouTube content is you, you create content based on what people are looking for. Um, and there's a lot of different ways you can figure out what it is people are looking for. Um, there's a lot of different websites that'll kind of tell you how often people search something and how often, um, uh, like how, how much competition there is. Um, so yeah, absolutely. There's, there's like, um, the marketing for author series. We kind of made them based off of what people were always asking us. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. uh, Sydney asks, will these slides be available to look at later? Um, I've never even thought about that. I know that's what like, I know from going to um, like business conventions that that's a thing that people do, but I personally have never done that. But this webinar will be up on YouTube for as long as I'm up on YouTube. So um, feel free to rewatch it and, you know, it'll be a recording at that point. So then you can skip through if you feel like I'm rambling too much, which, again, is the secret word for this stream. Um, how many videos are going to be done like this and will there be a playlist to go to afterwards? So yes, and I assume you're talking about um, the virtual retreat as a whole. Again, in the description down below, there is actually a playlist with all of the streams um, and that goes for also the schedule screen streams. Um, so yeah, they'll all, basically everything that you need will be linked down below. Um, how do you figure out the the statistics on ads and websites. So that really varies depending on um, what platform. So for websites, I have WordPress websites and um, there's a plugin, I believe it's like Jetpack or something where you can see the stats on all that. But more so for um, ads, like for Amazon ads, there's a whole dashboard where it breaks everything down. Um, and it's really something that I can't explain unless I physically went into it and like poked around. Um, but I kind of go into it in the marketing for authors series just because that's what the, mo that's what the book sales that multiply is really all about. Um, eh, okay. If you really like book blogging and happen to be an author, can you do a combined platform that inc incorporates both? Yes, absolutely. Actually, that's probably the best case scenario um, is that you're a book blogger to start with. And um, so, for example, if you're a book blogger and you have a publisher reach out to you and be like, hey, this book is coming out. Can you read the arc and promote it on your blog on the day it comes out? And you'll be like, yeah, of course. So. Just pretend you're your own, I mean, you are your own publisher. Treat your book like you would any other book you would promote. So um, maybe share a quote of the book and share um, the cover when it comes out and do a countdown to the day it comes comes out. There's a ton you can do. And honestly, it's almost easier to be someone who is a book blogger than to be someone who is teaching writing because I teach writing, but I am not targeting my genres. So I write in in uh, young adult fantasy, uh, thriller, and um, nonfiction. So ultimately, right now, the t the targeted audience based off of YouTube alone is nonfiction. 
Um, so it can almost be sometimes harder to market my fiction because you guys are not my target audience. So if you're a book blogger, then you are always ha talking to your targeted audience. Do, do, do. Uh, let me scroll through. Will you have this caption later? I have a hearing loss, so it's difficult to understand you're saying. Oh, I wasn't going to, but I might. <laughs> um, because I know this will be an hour long, so I'm like dreading captioning it, but I probably will. Or at least um, YouTube also generates captions, so you can rewatch it later. It'll probably be up in a day or so. Um, when is the best time to do paid advertising? After publishing your first book or after you have a backlog? Ooh, okay, let me think. Um, after publishing... I would say, so you're going to get the most return on investment if you have a backlog. And by that, I mean, um, if you have a series, if you have a four book series uh, and you run an ad on book one and you spend more, uh, yeah, so you spend more on advertising than you actually make off of sales off of book one, you may be like, this sucks. How am I, how is this supposed to make me money? Well, you also have to keep into account that even though you might be spending more on ads for one book, you potentially, if your book is good, then people will finish reading book one and they're going to want to move on to book two, book three, book four. Um, so ideally, you have a backlog. Um, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. So you can still have one book out and released and do very well in terms of ROI marketing that one book. Um, but you just have to be more careful. So it's going to be a little bit harder um, because there's, there's a lot of, if you've ever taken like a webinar that's just about uh, doing ads for books, you will hear a lot about making your ROI a lot larger by either selling a course at the, like if it's a nonfiction book, you sell a course at the end of the nonfiction book. Or um, if it's a fiction, you have a whole series and you try to get them to read the rest of the series. That way you're not just making money off of that one book that you sold. You're also making money off of the rest of the books in the series or the course or whatever. Um, so you, yeah. So yes, you can, do it just having one book, but you will make more ROI if you have multiple books. Um, da, 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 da. Okay, what's the best way to focus your marketing strategy when you plan to write in multiple genres? Do you focus more on one genre than the other or should you be marketing yourself more? Uh, so yeah, okay. So this is, this is basically the problem that I've encountered because I market, because I write in so many different genres. Um, but I don't think of it as multiple different genres, really. I think of it as I write in fiction and I write in nonfiction. So in terms of nonfiction that markets itself, I have a YouTube channel where I talk about exactly what I t um, talk about in the nonfiction book series. Uh, things get a little more tricky when it comes to uh, my fiction, but I think of it as this. No matter what genre I write in, I still have the same writing style. Um, I tend to write darker. Like, that's just my, uh, so, for example, Essence. It's about a girl who dies and watch over, watches over her family as they deal with her death. That's dark. Uh, I Am Mercy, Black Plague, 14th century France. Very dark and includes witchcraft and dark magic. Uh, she's Not Here, psychological thriller, the most different from all my books, but still very dark in the sense that it's about a woman who's just about lost her mind and is putting someone else's life at stake to find a cure. So. Yes, the books are very different in terms of genre, but the thing that connects them all is my style. I write dark fiction, so I try to market in terms of that. So find what connects all your books together, and obviously my children's book is not dark fiction. That's my cutest, most adorable book, um, but you get the idea. So find whatever connects all your books together, and instead of trying to market in terms of a genre, market in terms of your style. Um, do, do, do. Uh, another question for Meg. Uh, what are your thoughts on advertising on social media such as YouTube and Instagram, particularly if it's not book-centric advertising? Okay, so that, in terms of that, I have not had the best of luck in terms of marketing my books 
on Facebook. I have played with the idea of doing like, I have book trailers, but doing an ad of my book trailer on YouTube as like one of the skippable ads because I think that would do okay. Um, but it's not something I've experimented in yet, um, but it's a possibility. I think for any type of marketing that you're not sure of, the best thing that you can do is just dip your toe in and be like, how is this going? Um, I've done Facebook ads for webinars and I found those do okay. They're not like anything spectacular. Um, but the biggest thing is, especially if you're marketing, um, like if you're doing a Facebook ad for a free webinar, it's going to be a lot harder to get the ROI out of that. So um, obviously if it's a free webinar, people can sign up, no strings attached, but then you also don't make money that way. So what? ask yourself, how am I making money? And if at the end of the webinar you're promoting either a product or an online course or whatever, then you have to say to yourself, how much am I willing to spend on Facebook and what would the conversion rate need to be to um, make that money back and hopefully make a profit off of it? Um, because ultimately, um, in that example, if someone signs up for a free webinar and then they watch the webinar, a very, very small percentage of people will actually go ahead and do whatever the paid content is at the end. I think it's it's usually something like the, the, the average stat is less than 5%. So if you have 100 people watching the webinar, less than five of them will sign up for the paid product um, whatever that may be. So just keep that in mind when you're doing that sort of advertising um, because the percentages are very low. And that's not to say that you did your marketing bad. That's just that's just the stats. Like that is the industry standard. Um, and again, I, I, I'm pulling that number off of my head, I, but it's definitely lower than 5%. It's like something like 3% of people will end up signing up. Um, okay. Uh, at the beginning of your career, how did you find out about your writing style? I just, I, I don't think I fully understood what my writing style was until I was at least three books deep. Um, you'll notice for Essence and I and Mercy, they are told through first person present point of view, and she's not here is third person past. Um, and that's where I'm comfortable writing now. So you just, you develop as an author. And again, um, even though that's that, it's still very different in the sense that, um, or it's still very the same in the sense that they're all very dark, and that's just me. Um, da, 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 da. All right, this is the last question because um, I want you guys to head over to the next stream, and I don't want to go over on time. So if someone writes under two different names, what's your thoughts on that person using one platform for both if they're okay with people knowing that both names are the same person? It's a great question. Um, that's a gray area. So I would say that's probably okay. It's really about why are you writing under two different names? Is it so when people go on your Amazon page, they don't see, like, say you had a pen name for erotica, and then you had another name for, um, you know, just general fiction, like young adult fantasy. You would obviously want two different pen names for the sake of Amazon. So if someone was reading Young Adult, they didn't accidentally buy an erotica book and then get in trouble by their parents. Um, but then if you have a platform, and if you're okay with people knowing that it's the same person, that's totally fine. Um, the biggest example I can think of would be um, the Courtney Project um, because she writes for uh, the Kennedy Fox series. So obviously we know that's her and we can connect the dots. Yes, Keelan, you missed the secret word. It was rambling. <laughs> um, so yeah, as long as you are okay with that, that is totally fine. So it's really just going back into what are your reasonings for having the two different pen names? And usually it's just for the sake of Amazon and people not accidentally buying the wrong genre book. So that is it. I'm going to wrap up. I feel bad because there's still questions. So I'm actually going to go ahead and I'm going to stay tuned in the comments and answer some of them in the comments. If you guys, if whoever asked the questions want to stay tuned, but I am going to leave so you guys can move on to the next stream. So thank you all for watching. Enjoy the rest of the streams today. Make sure you fill out the form at the end. Again, secret word is rambling. Um, and that's what I'm doing.